This is a film about a new type of cosmetic surgery that has become the fastest growing in the UK. But it isn't a facelift or a tummy tuck. This is vaginal cosmetic surgery. I'm Lisa Rogers and I'm trying to understand why there are a growing number of women in the UK who seem to hate their vaginas. I sort of come out a bit like that. That is just horrible. Sorry, I'm looking at that picture thinking that is really horrible. Even teenage girls are seeing their GPs as they're convinced they need to go under the knife. I've got a picture here of a 16-year-old and that explains to you why I do this type of surgery. More and more British women are asking for what they think is the perfect vagina and most commonly the requests are for labiaplasties. In the private sector, one clinic alone has seen a 300% increase in these surgeries in the last two years. The way I would describe it is um, like a hot dog. Bap. <laughs> so I'm going to find out why it's happening and try to show women that we should love our lady bits rather than cut them up. Ooh. It's like a cauliflower. In the process, I'll have to check out my own fanny, challenge people along the way. When you're having sex for the first time with a woman, if she's got an ugly fanny, tell me. And see things that will stay with me forever. Her life is going to be crap. You know, her entire life is going to be crap. I decided to make a film about women and their vaginas because I want to try and understand why girls would want to cut up their bits. I think as women we obsess about our appearance and put far too much pressure on ourselves. You've got to have perfect hair, perfect face, perfect boobs, tiny waist, perfect bottom, perfect hairless legs, flat stomach. And there's always that question, isn't there? Who, who are women having surgery for? Are they doing it for themselves? Do they feel happier? They may think they are, but I think probably Underneath that is because they want men to find them attractive. So I'm going to see one of the UK's leading urogynaecologists, Professor Linda Cardoza. I'm hoping she can tell me why more and more women are having surgery on their private parts. I've done some research that's basically saying that vaginal plastic surgery is year on year the fastest growing procedure in, in, the, in the cosmetic or plastic surgery world. Is that, is that borne out by your experience? Well, in the National Health Service, the number of requests for labiaplasty, that's reduction of the labia minora, had doubled over a five-year period. Um, women have become much more aware of what is available. But that doesn't actually necessarily mean they know what's normal. But, I mean, you must appreciate that there's been a huge trend towards bikini waxing, doing things with your pubic hair as well as the hair on your head. And so if you can have cosmetic surgery to your face, you can also have cosmetic surgery to your genitals. Sometimes the requests for labiaplasty are very reasonable, but quite often the requests come from women who want to feel they look like other women. I mean, I sometimes get two generations, three generations of the same family coming and saying they want their labia trimmed. We've had a request from a 14-year-old here, from a 15-year-old, and they think that they want to look like other people, but actually what they're trying to look like is a small child, and they're never going to look like a small child as an adult woman. If I'm going to get my head around this thorny subject, I've got to look at my vagina. Time for a Brazilian. This is going to kill. I've not had a wax for over two years. Oh dear, full fur. But I need to trim the bush before Sharma gets her waxing stick on it. Do you feel hairy or have you got used to it? I've got used to it, to be honest. I've yeah. got used to how it is at the moment. <laughs> when was it that kind of Brazilians really became fashionable? Oh, I would say that the late 90s, you had Sex in the City. And there was that episode whereby they went and had their Brazilian waxing. And then it seemed it became the fashion. Oh. You're probably in a fairly unique position in that um, you've seen lots of women's bits, basically, yes. you know, because, yes. you, because you do, do waxings. Oh. When I first started waxing, I actually realised that we were all built very differently down there. <laughs> and I was quite shocked. I did. I went home to my husband, because obviously being a man of the world, you know, he'd seen far more than I had. <laughs> and I just said to him, you know, mine is quite pretty, isn't it? Whereas, you know, I've seen that some of them really are. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, 
incredibly painful. There's never been anyone that I haven't been able to wax. They've been more difficult to wax if um, the labia are more baggier, for want of a better word. Oh, my lips are burning. Oh. Now, would you like me to take any more? No, I'm, I'm too much of a coward. That's fine, thanks. Are you? Yeah. You don't want to be any thinner? Oh, it's quite red. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have anything. They're just not that pretty, really, are they? You know, no matter what you do. Them. I wonder whether teenage girls talk about their bits or whether it's a taboo subject for them, too. It's bizarre. My friends and I chat about sex all the time, but never about our twinkles. But if I'm going to get to the bottom of this subject, I've got to be able to talk about punanis. If somebody said to me, describe what you think men would like in a perfect fanny, I suppose it would be kind of not too much hair, kind of quite tucked in, the lips quite small and tucked in, um, probably not too tight, not too baggy. I don't know. The reason I'm so concerned about teenage girls wanting one of these mythical perfect vaginas is because my partner Paul and I have recently become parents to Mirabella and Florence. Because the water will help them to grow big and strong. You know, I'd just be horrified, absolutely horrified, if in 15 years' time Florence came to me and said, you know, I, I think I don't, don't, don't like the way my vagina looks, I don't like the way my vulva looks, I think I should have surgery. I'd feel like I'd failed as a parent, I think. I don't think Paul realised that by making this film, I'd start talking fannies morning, noon and night. I mean, would you, have you ever been kind of put off going there with somebody because it looked a bit, because it didn't look how you thought it was going to look? Or... No. <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a bad one. Do you think, is there any other men, that, I mean, do you talk about it with blokes? Like, on the surface, but not... Oh, God, you know, I saw a really strange fanny, you know. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I've ever had that conversation. To understand why a young girl would put herself through surgery, I need to meet one. 21-year-old Rosie is so unhappy about the way her vagina looks that she's booked in for surgery. It's my chance to ask her why. I mean, surgery does seem pretty extreme. It might seem extreme to other people, but I don't think of it as, like, you know, dangerous, anything like that, because I wanted it so much. I don't know, like, I've been picked on about it before, like... Who's picked on it? Who's picked my, on it? My sister, my, and then, like, um... She's told like guys that I've had a relationship with and then they've dumped me like the next day and stuff Your like that. Your sister has. But as a joke, as a joke. But that's not very funny really, is it? M my sister's a very out there character. I don't think she means it maliciously, she just does it to shock. I don't know, it's just when I was younger, like she used to pick on me and just be like, oh, like Rosie's got a, I hate saying it, I really hate saying it. Like she used to be like, Rosie's got a hanging ham and stuff like that. It ended up that I'd be out on a night out and I'd be stood there with all my mates, like, 11 guys, and they'd be ripping me to shreds about it in a club and I'd be like... Fuck. <laughs> like, what do I say? I just thought I was so different to everyone else that I wanted that to be changed. I'm astonished that Rosie feels so insecure that she's having surgery on a part of her body that no-one else can see. Making this documentary means 100 women or girls think twice about having surgery or think twice about crying in a corner on their own because they think there's something wrong with them or gives them the confidence to go and talk to a friend because they think there's something wrong with them. Well, it's worth doing, isn't it? Let's get out there and do it. I need to get an idea of the kind of images that are influencing girls like Rosie. I'll start in the obvious place. Well, I mean, looking at the porn mags, you would come to the conclusion that a designer vagina is virtually hairless, very neat, pink, tucked in, where all you can really see are the outer lips, um, and the inner lips are either non-existent or very small. <sighs> it's really worrying because they don't look like real women. And if girls are comparing themselves to this and thinking, I don't look like that, it's because the, the fannies they're looking at don't look like real fannies. That and there we have the problem. So what constitutes a normal Mary? I'm just looking at this medical research paper where measurements were taken of the whole genital area. Labia minora length, which is what everybody seems to be getting their knickers in a twist about, ranged from 20 millimetres to 100 millimetres, so that's between 2 centimetres and 10 centimetres. The range is enormous, and so there's, that just isn't 
ever communicated to women in any way. It's too late for me to try and dissuade Rosie from having surgery. Sadly, she's made up her mind and is determined to have a labia reduction. Her best friend Natalie has come to support her. Even she seems to have considered it more than Rosie. Do you have to have any stitches? Loads. I think so. So don't no. ask these questions, did you? No. <laughs> I did. OK. Rosie is having her labiaplasty done privately by Dr. Hend, who specialises in vaginal cosmetic surgery. OK. The bottom here. She'll have local anaesthetic and, shockingly, she'll be awake while she has her labia sliced off. Okay. <laughs> okay. Rosie, I want you to relax. Okay. Right, just cleaning your inside, Rosie. Okay. Right, so it's a little bit uncomfortable. Sorry, darling. Uh, sorry, sorry, that's it, okay. that's it. Okay. Right, you can see all that skin is too much. So what we're going to do, we're going to do some marking. It looks completely normal to me. Right, this is a little bit stingy here. Okay. You can be here and it now. Uh, You're doing very well. Sorry. It's okay. After one minute, you will not feel any pain, okay? okay. Oh, God, no more. It's okay. No, it will Don't come worry. Ah! Oh, Up, sharp? Yeah. You're not Such... taking drugs, are you? No. <laughs> I wish. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Labia is being cut. Went very well. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure you'll be very is happy with your result. Finished. I finished. Really? All done. <laughs> it's like elastic band. Once you cut it, you shrink. Okay. Yeah. Okay. On the other side. Oh my god. Mm -hmm. Can you please okay. clean? It's outrageous that a girl like Rosie has gone to such extreme lengths to make herself feel normal. Surely, girls, there must be another way. Oh, it's really swollen. OK, sorry. Okay. Look, I'm bleeding quite badly now. Like... <laughs> Hi, Daddy. Can I just speak to Mummy, please? Rosie just is in pain. The doctor told Rosie that the next few days would be the most painful. Although the procedure seems simple, it can take up to three months for the vagina to completely recover. Oh, I'm bleeding really badly. I know someone's like punched me in the groin. More than that, chopped you up in the groin. Rosie was teased by a group of male friends. I worry that men making derogatory comments might be one of the reasons girls are having surgery. So I've come to see my mates to see whether men are really influencing women when it comes to them chopping up their bits. Look, what's the most common <laughs> word that women are talking to other women about their private parts? What would you describe it as? That's, that's the thing, there is not a common word. vulgar. Yeah, there's not a common word. I mean, quite either women use kind of like childish words like frou frou or Mary or fairy. Flowers. Oh, you know, you've got kind of cunt and twat, which yeah. is down the kind of right down the vulgar end of the scale, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, have you ever kind of been in a situation where you've really liked a girl and then got there and thought, no, I'm not going to go any further because I don't like it? I never had. The only thing that put me off is the smell, but I never really had that either. When you meet a woman, I definitely don't think, oh, what does your fanny like? Point. Yeah, exactly. Are like you them. talking about. How hairy it is down there, or well, everything you know, having the lip size. Hairs, you know, the amount of hair down there is probably the only thing that blokes look at, or, or, or I don't know, that really registers. So, do you think? Do you think really... women are fretting about their bits unnecessarily? Yeah, though? massively. Yeah, that's real news to me. I must admit, just something not, you don't think just about. Not really. Not concern. No, not a concern. No. I'd like to think all men are as easygoing as my mates, but I've got a horrible feeling that isn't the case. What do you fancy for tea today? Um, sausages. 
31-year-old Kelly was raised by her grandparents and when she hit puberty, she was discouraged from talking about her changing vagina. To compensate, she openly talks to her three children about their genitals. What, what body part names do you know, Jack? Um, what's what? Um, no, not in Welsh. Willies. <laughs> Willies, yeah. <laughs> you know, don't you, Gabrielle? You know the word for your lady garden. Your, for your foof. <laughs> <laughs> you do. <laughs> you know it's a vagina. My vagina is, to me, not... It's a, it's a bit like... The, the way I would describe it is um, like a hot dog bap. Since her teens, Kelly has hated her vagina and has considered liposuction and a labia snip. So I've come to find out why. Why do you think it is that even our generation don't talk about our vaginas? Even saying the word vagina, it's kind of a really... You kind of want to go... Vagina. Vagina, <laughs> When I started my period, I thought I was dying. And when I spoke to my grandmother about it, um, it was like, oh, shh, 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 don't let your grandfather hear what you're saying, don't do this, don't do that. Um, and so automatically, to me, that area of your body is bad and secret and you mustn't say anything at all about it. Added to that, I'm a natural redhead. And so when I started to develop and started sprouting the hair everywhere, I so wanted to be the same as everybody else. But I used to use mascara and colour it in, you know? <laughs> Oh, it's great to look back and laugh now. I mean, the idea of putting mascara on your pubes is hilarious, isn't it? To me, it's negative, and I do compare. I mean, my husband and I have, have watched pornographic films together, and all I think about then is, why are we watching this? Because cause he wants this image of perfection. And I do think, well, oh, would it be better? Would I be sexier if, if I nip this bit off and tuck that bit in, you know? Do you feel like you should be competing or, or do, do you, f I mean, because part of me thinks, you know, fuck that image. What I want to do is say, I'm me, I'm happy with me, and if you don't like me the way I am, then you can quite happily fuck off, frankly. Kelly seems to have suffered because she was raised by an older generation. I don't remember speaking to my mum about how my bits looked either. It might have taken me 36 years, but I'm going to be brave and chat fannies with her and her friends. Oh, and by the way, my mum's the one at the head of the table. It's not a natural thing to talk about in amongst my generation. I don't think, is it, no, Kay? Def no, definitely no, not. Definitely not. We didn't talk about anything like that when we were youngsters. But you didn't see mm. each other's in those no. early no. days, no. anyway. I can remember a conversation with my mother at one time when she said, well, you must wear a nightdress because it's so much easier when you get married, sort of thing, and I thought... <laughs> <laughs> what for? <laughs> It's really weird for me having this conversation with you about sex. It's really weird. After group hysterics, we finally settle down to talk about the matter in hand. So are girls looking at themselves and thinking it doesn't look right? And if it doesn't look right, how do they know if you haven't looked at anybody else? Yes, I wouldn't know if mine mm -hmm. would look right or not. But, but do they then have sort of plastic surgery? Is that what happens? I don't think it's necessary at all. Not necessarily. No, unless there's there are a parts problem. Of your body that you can't see, and you and just maybe you're not meant to. Not meant to. I just wonder how how these girls feel after they've had it done. So. so. <laughs> 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 to Brighton to meet professional sculptor Jamie McCartney. He's casting 160 women's vulvas to make a sculptural vaginal wall. I'm hoping that together we can show women that every vagina is unique and that there's nothing wrong with that. What happened was I originally was going to be 40 and then when I finished the first 40 I kind of looked at it I just didn't think it had quite enough visual impact so I thought imagine that four times the size. Yeah. Actually even looking at them makes a difference to how I feel. Yeah. A group of girls who are comfortable with their vaginas are having casts done today. They've agreed to share their experience with us, all in the name of loving our labia. Everyone thinks I'm gay because I've got a bald head and I'm in Brighton here. Yeah. Are you ready? So you're just going to peel it off? And it's a girl. 
<laughs> round of applause now. Thank you. Well done, guys. I mean, what age do you think that, that we should start doing sex education with children? When you go into secondary school and then you have somebody special, usually charismatic, with lots of toys, come in and then they talk to you a little bit and you, show, you get shown a diagram and there's nothing to do with your relationship with yourself. Well, there's sex education um, and then yeah. there's body confidence. Yeah. Which is different. Which I think is different, yeah. Because knowing what, about your vagina isn't really sex education, is it? No, that's, that's being aware personal, of your body. Yes. Yeah. So we, we're calling the wrong thing. We make yeah. a slight misnomer, isn't it? Calling it sex education. Because like, I think like you were saying about talking about things from a young age, you yeah. should be able to talk about your vagina yeah. with whoever from a really young age. It yeah. just should just be normal yeah. instead of taboo. So now it's my turn. Here goes. Ooh. Right, blue goo for you. It's uh, kind of dribbly. Yeah, it's quite chilly as well. Oop, that's starting to set. Do you have a preference? You know, it's like when you're with someone, it doesn't really matter what they've got, if you like them, sort of love me, love my bits sort of thing. And, it, and when it comes down to it, you don't kind of reject someone on the grounds of their... Um, the way they look, they do. A few moments later, it's time for me to confront my own vagina. Kind of just different now to how it was ten years ago. Because it always change as you get older and have children. It's that deep children. <laughs> <laughs> when you're at school, they tell you what your vagina is for. But from what I remember of my sex education lessons, no one explained just how much your genitals change during puberty. And that's on top of all the other teenage angst we have to go through. I think it's the most horrendous time, actually, in terms of body image. I know when I was 15, I decided I was going to go on a diet and all I ate for two weeks was apples. I mean, how unhealthy is that? What do you remember about what you felt when your body was changing? Relief, because I was so bloody old. You know, everybody else kind of had boobs and started their periods and everything, and I didn't get my period till I was 14, so I was just so relieved that finally I was starting to grow up. Which is one of the reasons I get so kind of uh, worried about women having plastic surgery when they're under about 21. Teenage girls can be incredibly bitchy and judgmental, you know, and I don't think that there's any girl that doesn't feel at some point she's the one that's getting some stick. I suppose back when I was a teenager, nobody really looked at their vagina because they weren't waxed, uh, and now they are. I've got a lot to answer for, this waxing. You know, people can see what's there. Um, and it's, again, it's about fitting in. And actually, you grow up, and as you grow up, you realise that you don't need to fit in. You can, you know, actually, the most attractive thing about somebody is being themselves. But trying to explain that to a, to a teenager, well, you just can't do it. You've just got to learn it. But then, if during that process of learning, you've had an operation on your, your vagina to change it, then it's, it's irreparable, particularly if it's been a bad operation and it's... Oh, God, you know, you've had your labia removed. Consultant plastic surgeon Eric Scholten has performed labia reductions on 16-year-old girls. He's the pioneer of a new technique in labiaplasties and business is booming. But I've come to discuss my concerns with him. And what kind of women come to you um, wanting surgery on their vaginas? All sorts of women come to see me. Um, for example, 16-year-old girls who are very embarrassed and who will never have a boyfriend, but also uh, people who come to see me after childbirth. Do you think that it's the embarrassment we should be dealing with rather than the actual physical side of it? Because it's, it's in, the embarrassment is a psychological thing, surely? It is indeed, but um, all these people for so long have tried to do that and to live with it and to feel normal, but they don't. When I was 16, if there had been plastic surgery to make me taller, I would have been there like that. If I'd had the money, I'd have been there, I'd have had it. But now, if there was plastic surgery to make me taller, I wouldn't take it because I realise that being as short as I am is uh, part of what makes me me. Do you, I, do you understand what I mean? I totally understand what you say. And I've got a picture here of a 16-year-old and that explains to you why I do this type of surgery. This 16-year-old, on the left you see her before the surgery, is very reluctant to expose herself to a boyfriend. I can understand why, you know, if you were 16, you would not have seen somebody else's vulva looking like that because in kind of classic porn shots or uh, classic drawings in, in biology books, whatever, you don't see you don't see vulvas that look like this. I just think 16 is so young to start mucking around with your body. 
If I'm going to truly understand why girls want labiaplasties, I have to put myself in their position and see whether he thinks I'd need surgery on mine. Oh, God. It's all very well me doing a programme about plastic surgery on people's vaginas and asking questions about it and being quite critical about it. But, um, you know, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I don't have the right to be like that if I'm not prepared to, to uh, you know, not put my money where my mouth is, put my fanny where my mouth is. And quite frankly, yeah, I am slightly hacking it. I decided to go on this journey to discover why women are having vaginal plastic surgery. But I didn't think for a minute I'd have a surgeon giving a critique on mine. And breathe. <sighs> Do you know what? This is far worse than getting my bits cast by Jamie. Because it's, it's somebody who's looking at them with, with a judgmental eye. The way it works best, Lisa, is if I lay you down a little bit in this chair. OK. Then you put your feet up here. Mm -hmm. And then if you drop your knees to the side. OK. Yeah. So the back of the chair goes down a little bit. OK. So if we open the outer labia a little bit, we can see the skin on the clitoral hood. And we can see the labia, which are fairly thin in your case. The inset of your inner labia is quite high. They don't, they don't go down all the length of the, the vulva slit. Right. So all in all, um, I think your vulva is pretty normal. OK. Um, I suppose the question I want to ask is, has anybody come to you with a vulva that doesn't look that dissimilar to mine who, who would want surgery? Uh, yes, they have. Did she say what she wanted different? Yes, she felt that there was a little bit too much skin on the clitoral hood. And so she wanted that changed? She wanted that changed. If you have a little bit of extra skin on your upper eyelids, you have a change. That's extraordinary. See, that to me is absolutely extraordinary. This is the one wicked and wonderful world of cosmetic surgery. It's only got a vodka and tonic. Oh, my God. I'm not the only one getting my bits out today. On my advice, Kelly has gone to Brighton to have a vaginal cast. She hates the way her vulva looks so much that she's considered surgery. But I'm hoping that having a cast might persuade her to love her lips the way they are. Come on in. So here are some of the others. What's your, what, what, what do you think, just looking at them all? My initial reaction is they all look really, really different. I wasn't expecting to see that's a, that variety. <laughs> Knock, knock. I'm as prepared as I'm ever going to be. And just lay down. And just lay down, yeah. <laughs> just lay down. There we are. Thanks. This is the bit I hate about it the most. <laughs> What's that? The parrot beak. Parrot beak? <laughs> well, that's what I think it looks like. Really? <laughs> yes. Do what you got to do. <laughs> OK. A little bit wider. Oh! Oh! <laughs> Have you told other people that you're going to do it? Um. Well, my husband knows. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I told my grandmother, and I wouldn't have told my granny probably. So. Oh, well, I, but she raised me, and oh, I think for, it was nice. We, we actually had a proper conversation about it, and it's it's almost like a weight is lifted, and um, I, I think she understands now why I felt the way I did. Here's your here's your mold. Oh, that looks really small. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting this massive <laughs> thing that was going to go, all right, Cal. <laughs> it's quite neat. <laughs> so this is surprising for you? Yeah, we, uh, yeah. I feel like crying now. <laughs> oh. I actually would say to anybody to recommend to do this, to, to have a good look and to, to see if your perception of yourself is actually the way it is, and because I think that that would stop a hell of a lot of women from going down the wrong route and, and making a mistake. Because uh, I wouldn't want to get anything done to that. I'm happy that Kelly's seen the light and regards her foo with affection. Too many women want to go for the quick fix and have surgery.
It's probably unrealistic to think that I can encourage insecure girls not to have surgery, but apparently that's what holistic sexual educator Rachel Fuchs does. Well, there's very few opportunities, I think, that women have to actually talk about their vaginas, that actually have to talk about their genital healing, and I get to hear about it on one-to-one -one with clients. I like Rachel's ethos, but one of her more bizarre techniques is to encourage women to show each other their vaginas in a bid to stop them going under the knife. It seems extreme, but she swears by it. I'm going to find out more. OK, so what they're doing first of all is they're looking at their own vaginas, so they're having a very good look at themselves. And she is now talking about how she feels looking at herself. I think it's from having sex quite a lot in the last week that this area here is quite um, almost like rough. like a, yeah. And you can see that she's getting a little bit upset here as she um, touches into some memories. I've not been treating myself, um, not been giving myself that, um, I, I can't find the words. From my experience of working with women, I've had a lot of experience of, of, of seeing what stories are locked into the vagina. So do you think, you think, you're, <laughs> I'm just laughing, so every vagina's got a story? Why would there not be emotions in the vagina? Why would there not be, like, memories, for example, of, uh, of, of times, <laughs> Sorry, you know? Laugh. It just, it's really funny, like, part of... There is part of me that wants... that really wants to go with this, and then part of me just goes... It, it's just a bit sort of trippy, hippie. I, I just don't, you Do know... Do I look trippy, hippie? This is their choice, and it's up to them, isn't it, to do, to do what they want to do. Some people might like to go to the football on a Saturday, some people might like to do this. It's amazing that Rachel has stopped women having surgery, but getting your fanny out for all and sundry, well, it's all a bit new age for me. It's funny, isn't it, how you learn so much about yourself? Because I, it's really weird. In my head, I think I'm really liberal, and then I go and do things like this and think, actually, perhaps I'm not that liberal. I'm clearly entirely the wrong person to be doing this documentary. Oh, shit. <laughs> Before setting off for London to see Rosie, who's due to have her stitches out, I decided to ask the painters and decorators what they think of Our Lady Flowers. But you know what? I wish I hadn't bothered. What would, what would you say is, is a perfect vagina for you? Uh, a shaven one. Would, would you agree with that, Kev? No, I do like a bit of hair. You like a bit of hair. And um, then what about the size of, I, size of the lips and things like that? I prefer them tucked in. I don't like a, a, like a squash hair job. Some women can get flaps and bulbers tucked in their socks. Have I you had know. experience of a lady with, with, with... Not tucked in their socks, beef, no. Beef, beef, beef <laughs> curtains. Beef curtains, like that. Oh, no. Uh... I mean, is it something you kind of look at, though? Well, yeah, because um, I do like oral sex, you know, giving and receiving, and... Um, uh, it's like having a presentation with your, with your meal. You know, if it's all slapped on, you know, and it's all, you know, mushy peas everywhere, it puts you off a bit, doesn't it? You know, <laughs> you've got to have something that looks nice, you know, before you taste it. When you're having sex for the first time with a woman, if she's got an ugly fanny, sorry, mate. <sighs> but I think you're being very honest by telling us what you're telling us, yeah. John. But yeah. at the same time, I do think you're being hideously sexist. You've got some damp up your mind as well. I have, you need yeah. You to put oil-based undercoat before your emulsion is seen and always will just come through again. Will do. I'm not surprised, I'm saddened. I think the truth is I knew, really, my heart of hearts, that there were going to be guys out there who responded in that way. But I think just to hear it so blatantly, it made me want to say, get your cock out and then go, oh, that doesn't look very nice, which I think maybe is stepping beyond the boundary for somebody who won't have any employed to paint my beams. Rosie suffered at the hands of men making comments about her vagina, which was one of the reasons she had her labia trimmed. Although her recovery was excruciating, she's pleased that she had the operation, but I'm sad that I wasn't able to stop her. It looks so much better than it did before, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'm going to just cut the stitches. Mm -hmm. Just to ease the tension. The more you relax, yeah. mm -hmm. the more comfortable you will be in minutes. Yeah. Okay? I'm trying, so I'm so I know, sorry. I know. So once we take it off, you should be comfortable. You're shaking. Okay. <gasps> no, no, no. It's all right. You're doing very well, Rosie. I'm just holding it, I'm not pulling it. I know, I know, I know. All right? I know, I know. Do you want me to give you some local? 
No. You sure? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just scared. Yeah, that's okay. It's Wait, I know you are scared. Take some deep breaths. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you All done. Thank you. That's it. You'll feel much comfortable within half an hour. Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. You can get dressed. That's got to be a relief. Yeah. In half an hour, you're going to feel better. Mrs. Susan. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> you all right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. How many of these operations do you do, say, in a month? On average, I mean, you know, I'm not... On average. Time. I would say about 10, 15. A month? Mm. When I started this operation, and I was criticised for doing it. Mm. But I remember one Australian patient came to me about lipoplasty. And when she saw her GP, and she told him she had quite a lot of skin hanging down, he was hysteric, the way he laughed. And she walked out of the clinic, and she never went into a relationship after his laugh. So her male GP laughed at her? Yes. So that's just appalling. Yes. That's appallingly yes. unprofessional. Yes, but it happened. Right. He, he felt, you know, she got it in her head and he laughed. Did that happen to you, Rosa? Well, yeah, I've, I've been laughed at, haven't I, by guys about it. I've been laughed at by my own sister about it, so... What about any medical, uh, medical profession? Have they, they haven't I haven't it? gone... I haven't gone to... Like, most people go, go for smear tests at my age and I haven't gone because I was too scared. Ethically, just as a human being, how do you feel about the fact that women feel they have to have surgery? Really, I'm not going to talk about whether it's right or wrong. There's no one can force anyone to go for surgery. The way we treat patients, if they affect them psychologically and you can help them, why not? So if the excess skin is there, you want to trim it, you trim it. I hate to say it, but Dr. Hender's got a point. Rosie wanted it done, and she claims it's changed her life already. I felt really maternal towards Rosie, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean... Oh, God, if that was Florence or Mirabelle, I'd just feel absolutely distraught. But then she's there, she's going to feel better after it, she's going to be happy. Is one worth it, one worth the other, aren't they? Night, gorgeous girl. Sleep tight, God bless. I'll see you in the morning, please. Back at home, whilst researching other alternatives to vaginal operations, I discovered something even more alarming. Oh, my God. <sighs> Laser hymenoplasty. This restorative and reconstructive surgery prepares the hymen as if no penetration ever occurred. It's sensitive to the needs of women from all cultures that embrace these particular issues because of cultural, social or religious reasons. <gasps> My God. That's truly appalling. A minority of Muslim women are expected to prove their virginity on their wedding night by bleeding. In a bit to conceal that they've already had sex, some are turning to surgery and having their hymen repaired. Strangely, in the Western world, this is considered to be cosmetic surgery. This procedure isn't common practice among the Islamic community, but I'm surprised it's happening in the UK. So I've come to a youth centre to see if a group of Muslim teenagers can shed any light on the matter. If somebody, if there was a girl watching this, or parents watching this who had a girl who had a broken hymen and they were considering going and having hymenoplasty, what would you say to them? Where did it even come from? Like, when was it right to get your hymen sewn back in? Why well, you shouldn't even have the choice mm. to do it. Because you know that a hymen can be broken in all sorts of different ways. So what if you were one of the unlucky ones that went horse riding well, and you were still a virgin? Were married and um, say, you know, you're, you, you're a virgin, okay. but your hymen had broken because you went horse riding yeah. and then you didn't bleed. Yeah. And then your new husband and his family made a big fuss about it. How would you react to then that? Then you pick the wrong husband, you get divorced and you go and find a better one. Yeah. I mean, we're all unanimous here that it's like a weird, strange thing to yeah. do in the 21st yeah. century. Yeah. So why does it happen? Would you expect a girl to be a virgin if you're going to marry her? Yeah. You, you were. Yeah. You can't marry a girl who's been around, can you? Why not? But let's say you get married to me, yeah? So when it goes by and goes, I've been there and done that. Is that what you're going to say? But what if yeah, another girl walks past and goes, I've been there, done that about you, if you slept with her? Then I'll take you off my chart, innit? 
But seriously, everything you said is just just smacks to be a massive double standard. Do you know what I mean? It's like you expect you expect the girl that you're going to marry to be a virgin. Well, in my opinion, full stop. I ain't going to marry a girl who's not a virgin. That's it. That doesn't help a 19-year-old Muslim girl that I've come to meet. She's desperate to have her hymen restored before her arranged marriage. Um, so, how can I help you today? Um, I have a problem because I'm no longer virgin, so I need to have this hymen reattachment surgery. I'm just scared that if they find out I'm not a virgin, that's just the worst thing that could ever happen. It's worse than death. I think death is even better than finding out that I'm not a virgin. Do you, do you feel guilty because you've been oh, from marriage? Yeah. To be honest, it was... I fell in love with that guy and I didn't... I didn't know that he was just, you know, using me and lying to me. He just... I was, was, he, was he from your community as well, the guy yeah. you in love with? He was, but... He lied to me and I didn't know he was married himself. He was just using me, but I didn't know that. So I was just doing everything to make him happy. He was just lying to me and now I've got my punishment. Uh, I will try to contact some doctors and hopefully they will make it for you. I've tried, but they're just looking at me as if it's not a big thing. They don't even realise that three lives can get involved in this because if my parents find out, they'll probably just kill themselves. They'll kill me first and then they'll kill themselves. The Iranian and Kurdish women's rights organisation try to support women who find themselves in this situation. I find it hard to accept that a young girl would have a hymenoplasty and consider it her punishment. And she said to me in the lift, she said, you know, Yeah, she said to me, the only reason I'm doing this is because I love my family, so I don't care about the bloke. She said if it was about the bloke, I wouldn't care. Yeah. Parents realise they are ruining their children's lives. Her life is going to be crap. You know, her entire life is going to be crap. then you've got to ask yourself, are we in such a better position, you know? We're all sexually liberated. <laughs> What's the result of sexual liberation? We're worried that our flaps are too big and having them chopped off, you know? This has been the most depressing part of my journey so far. Surely things have got to get better from here. I've come to meet a 32-year-old mum who spent the last three years wanting a labiaplasty. I really hope I can at least make Reagan think again, using everything I've learned so far. It wasn't until I... You know, my relationship came to a head. But only no comments are made. And he was like, oh, you've had two kids, big flappy fanny, it's like the Mosey Tunnel, nobody's ever going to want you, all that. that what he yeah, said to you? just, yeah. And it really did play on my mind. And so I thought, I'll go to the doctors and see if there's anything that can be done. So I went down there and she referred me to a consultant and I went in and they said, yeah, that's fine, we'll do the operation. They explained everything. And then the day before I was supposed to have the operation, they phoned me up and they had to postpone it. And I haven't gone back since. I think she's had a lucky escape, but it still preys on her mind. So I'm bringing her to see Rachel Fuchs, who teaches women to love their vaginas. I get my ladies to take on the voice of their vagina. What does their vagina want? What does their vagina not like? And what their vagina doesn't say is chop me up, cut me up, sew me up and make me tighter under a surgeon's knife. Rachel insists that in her session, Reagan will learn to love her vagina and stop thinking about surgery. So I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt and see if her magic works. Admitting that you feel this way about yourself is very, um, It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Just opens up another can of worms, really. But I'm cacking myself that Rachel expects me to get my bits out too. Before Reagan confronts her vagina, Nadana, who's an experienced participant, is going to show us how it's done. 
Oh, uh, and by the way, the word for our vaginas here is yoni. <sighs> and as everything's by invitation, it's when Nadana feels ready for us to look with her. Yeah, I don't mind if you look. There's a lot of quietness in my whole, in my body when I, when I look at it. Actually, wow, this is my yoni. <laughs> there is that kind of sense. Like, fuck, oh my God, this is, is a hole and it leads up. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Nadana. Oh, yeah, you can. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sitting in the, in the driving seat. I'm quite happy to go first, if you want me to. If that's all right with you, yes. Yeah. Mm. I'm really worried that I'm going to look really fat. Yeah, this is soft. There you go, darling. <laughs> so when you're ready... Have a look at yourself. <clears throat> See, it's funny, because the first thing I see is where I had varicose veins from when I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. That's the first thing I can see. Mm. But that's a memory you have. Yeah. Sorry. You're doing really well. You're doing really well. You're doing so well. Nice uni breathing exercise. Yeah. Regan, come back into the space with us. I feel a bit spooked. Oh, so well. It's fine. You're all invited to look if you want to. Mm. But see, you... I don't think it's attractive at all. Don't like these bits, basically. And I look at it and I think, ugh, it just looks like a cauliflower. I don't want to have cauliflower. I want something prettier. Your yoni is so beautiful. Mm, thank you. So beautiful. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say if there's any mm. consolation, I don't think it looks anything like a cauliflower. Mm. <laughs> you don't eat your veg then, do you? <laughs> mm. <laughs> I'm so wrapped up in Reagan, I'd forgotten that Rachel wants me to join in the yoni display. Did Lisa, did, did you want to go as well? It was that. The truth is, the thought of doing it is actually making me feel like I'm going to be sick and faint, but, you know. Oh. <laughs> well, really, I'm not just going to force you. It is once you get past the initial, it's quite... Well, you do get a moment of, fucking hell, yeah! <laughs> I'm cantering on the horse up to the jump, you know, and I can see it's Beecher's Brook, it's the big, it's the big jump. All right, know. then, let's get on with it, then. <laughs> you only be with you. All right, mate, you've got a new name now. It's Yoni, all right? No more foo-foo. You've got a relationship going on with your Yoni, a little chat. <laughs> your Yoni's probably got a really wicked sense of humour. <laughs> really great jokes. <laughs> I'd like to think so. I'm not that happy with the, with the way she's waxed at the moment, I have to say. Are so you I'm not? sorry about that, mate. And, uh, and also, after you have babies, it looks a bit older, you know? It doesn't look the same as it did before. Yeah. Yeah, I've got varicose veins too. Um, so you're feeling that age as well, from uh, similar yeah. to what you said after babies as well. Yeah. Like a second-hand car. <laughs> I've lost my Porsche. <laughs> I've got my Volvo now. <laughs> I think I kind of look at my children and go, it's such a small price to pay. Mm. So, uh, mm. well done. Well done, <laughs> well done, well done. you. I didn't think you were going to do it. No, I didn't think I was going to do it either. Has it been a benefit for you two? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I didn't think I'd feel this way. I felt earlier, I thought, yeah, what a load of... <laughs> but now I feel a little bit differently. Yeah. It's amazing that the healing session has made Reagan realise that surgery isn't the solution, but she still has a long way to go. It's just the beginning of her journey and nearly the end of mine. This film really is the, is the end of a journey which started um, two, two years ago when I got pregnant. Because I, I didn't do what most people do, which is kind of slowly grow up and slowly stop partying and meet somebody and settle down and get a house. And, you know, I was partying, then I got pregnant. And so I had to grow up really suddenly. And I think this film is kind of 
um, I kind of feel like a woman. And having having children obviously makes you feel like a woman, but doing this also makes me feel like um, I'm a grown up. I now know, more than ever, that I'm responsible for doing everything I can to make sure my girls grow up feeling comfortable about their bodies. I'm really going to make such a conscious effort to make sure I have a, a normalised conversation about sex and sex, the matter of a sexual nature with them. I've seen surgeons and alternative therapies and I've come up with my own solution that won't cost you a penny. It just doesn't matter what your vagina looks like. Love it. Love your flaps.